Hey everyone, welcome back to all my listeners. Now I hope everyone's having a great day so far. I know I am. And if it's your first time finding me, thanks so much and welcome. Now guess what you guys, it's going to be a long weekend once again as I'm recording this episode. So I really do hope everybody has a safe and happy 4th of July on Monday and celebrate our freedoms, reflect on what freedom means to you, and spend that quality time, like I said, with friends and family. They mean everything. Now, all right, you guys, let's go ahead and dive into today's episode. This is going to be episode number 10 of season six. Today is Wednesday, July 6th, 2022. My name is Somo Patel, and this is the Paint the Medical Picture podcast series. Now, all right, you guys, as always, please go ahead and start the week off strong. Go ahead and aim to crush all of your goals by the end of the week. Just keep staying positive, and I know you can get and receive anything it is that you want. Now, all right, you guys. Let's go ahead and begin today's episode. I'm going to be diving into my compliance tip today and get us back to basics in the No Surprises Act. And I'm going to be featuring my new grab bag filled newsworthy updates today because I have three newsworthy updates regarding newsworthy ENM guideline and CPT changes for 2023 that just rolled out by the AMA, as well as some juicy news on Modified 25 and some big news on the transparency in coverage rule. And of course, I'll close out today's episode with some inspirational words on vision and leadership from Theodore Hesburgh. If you checked me out on LinkedIn, you know I'm all about compliance and protecting our physicians and our valued healthcare professionals when it comes to the business of medicine. I hope this week with me brings you enough to take back to your organizations, to want to dive in deeper, to use my tips and best practices to ensure success. I hope this podcast will help you boost the quality of documentation capture and improve coding accuracy as you help all your providers paint the medical picture. If you like what you're hearing, please go ahead and hit that subscribe button now so you don't miss another episode. Please write in a review and kindly drop me a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to my podcast. I really love your support. And as always, a friendly disclaimer. Remember, I'm bringing you the news, current healthcare industry news, my compliance tips and my recommendations based on my over 12 years of experience in front office, in back end, in coding, and in billing for multi specialty physicians, in compliance, and in auditing for both ENM and surgical operative reports. These are my opinions alone and are not to be construed as legal advice. So let's get into Newsworthy. So, you know, I developed my grab bag feature of Newsworthy, right? Because there are some weeks that are just jam packed with so much news. So first I wanted to go over the new publication by the AMA, that's our American Medical Association, on the new CPT evaluation and management code and guideline changes that take effect on January 1st 2023. Now that gives us just about six months to educate our providers on these new big changes. I'm going to highlight 15 of those big changes, but please be mindful and take time to read the 42 page PDF document that was just published on Friday by the AMA. Now, the ENM introductory guidelines related to hospital inpatient and observation care services codes of 99221 through 99223, 99231 through 99239, and consultation codes 99242 through 99245, 99252 through 99255, as well as emergency department services codes from 99281 through 99285. Then the next big change is going to involve the nursing facility codes from 99304 through 99310, as well as 99315, 99316. 
then also changes are going to be reflected in our home or resident service codes with 99341, 99342, 99344, 99345, 99347 through 99350. Now, some deletions are going to include the deletion of hospital observation codes, which are going to be those ENM codes 99217 through 99220. And also, in particular, there will be revisions of hospital inpatient and observation care services ENM codes. Those will include our CPT codes 99221 through 99223. 99231 through 99239, as well as the guidelines involved with those codes. And to be specific, just to give you a heads up, they are going to be very similar to our outpatient office ENM codes, which are going to include leveling or choosing those various ENM codes based on time and or medical decision making. But again, be mindful and dig into those 42 pages of the PDF document because everything is highlighted in green for you. Those are all of the new changes and additions that have been made. Then let's move on. There will also be a deletion of consultations in the ENM codes for 99241 and 99251. Moving on, there's also going to be a revision of consultations in the ENM codes 99242 through 99245, as well as 99252 through 99255, as well as the reciprocal guidelines that are involved. Then let's move on. There's also a revision of our emergency department services ENM codes from 99281 through 99285, as well as those guidelines. Then moving on, there will also be a deletion of Nursing Facility Services ENM code 99318, as well as a revision of Nursing Facility Services ENM codes that range from 99304 through 99310 and 99315 and 99316, as well as a revision of those guidelines. Then let's move on. There's also going to be a deletion of, of rest home and domiciliary, which are our boarding homes, or custodial care. Those codes are those ENM codes that will be deleted, 99324 through 99238, as well as 99334 through 99337, 99339, and 99340. There's also going to be a deletion of home or resident services ENM code 99343. There's also a revision of home or resident services ENM codes, which include 99341, 99342, 99344, 99345, 99347 through 99350, as well as those reciprocal guidelines. Then let's move on. There will be a deletion of prolonged services ENM codes that range from 99354 through 99357. Then there's going to be a revision of guidelines for prolonged services ENM codes, specifically 99358, 99359, 99415, and 99416. And then there will also be a revision of prolonged services ENM code 99417 and its guidelines. And then finally, there is going to be the establishment of prolonged services ENM code that is going to be a new code that they've held a placeholder for in 993X0, as well as the established prolonged services guidelines that reflect that new code, 993X0. Then let's move on to my second newsworthy grab bag item, and that's going to involve the Juicy Modifier 25. Now, I hope all of you caught my interview last week with my good friend, Jennifer McNamara, on her podcast, Life as a Coder podcast, where we, in fact, discussed a lot of the history and facts and findings for Modifier 25. 
Now, Cigna recently planned for a reimbursement policy update in early June that would have been made effective on August 13th, 2022. In it, they in fact stated that they would have required the submission of documentation to support the use of Modifier 25 when billed with established ENM CPT codes 99212 through 99215, as well as a minor procedure. Now, remember, those are the established office ENM codes in 99212 through 99215. Now, that policy created a lot of hullabaloo for those of us in the industry. Now, our commercial payers have over the years tried to implement changes in their reimbursement policies for modifier 25 from time to time. And in this case, there was a lot of pushback from our medical societies that were distressed, that they believed would demand a lot of extra office work on their end for this new type of hypothetical policy change, which required documentation to be sent in along with the claims. But however, breaking news from Cigna has indicated, quote, notification, the scheduled effective date of August 13th, 2022 for the modified 25 reimbursement policy update for denial of evaluation and management service codes 99212 through 99215 when performed with a minor procedure without the submission of office notes has been delayed. The policy is under additional review and Cigna will provide follow-up communication and new implementation information when available, end quote. And you too can definitely find this information. Cigna has made it publicly available on their reimbursement policy page for the modifier 25. So when the medical societies decide to get together and push back, they do make their voices heard. And so therefore, in this particular case, for this particular commercial payer, Cigna, Cigna has put a halt to this possible implementation on August 13th, 2022. And my good friend Jen and I, we did discuss that very fact on her podcast last week when we looked into our crystal ball together and we had the foresight to say that perhaps Cigna is going to hold back on this, um, especially since they tried to implement this document as early as June, believing that they could implement such a rapid change by August 13th, 2022. That's simply not enough time for them to have implemented changes on their software, on their processes, as well as given their contracted providers enough time for notification of these particular um, prepayment policy change that they wanted for the modifier 25. So this newsworthy grab bag item is very good news. Now let's move on to my third grab bag feature. Finally, it's going to highlight the fact that the transparency and coverage rule took effect just a few days ago on July 1st, 2022 after the initial delays in enforcement way back in January 2022. Now, health plans and health insurance payers must publicly disclose or publish pricing information for covered items, supplies, and services in very specific machine-readable files on the health plan or health insurance payers' public website. Some of these specifics include that the files must include number one, rates for all covered items and services between the plan or the insurer and in-network providers. And number two, the allowed amounts for and billed charges from out-of-network providers. Now, it's also important to note that CMS requires that the website for the individual health plan or the individual health insurance payer be public and completely free of charge, there should be no other condition for a person to input their personal private information, nor should there be any requirement for a login or a password to obtain any details of rates, allowed amounts, and bill charges under the transparency in coverage rule. And now, 
It's time for my best practice tips in trusty tip. So in today's new back to basics compliance tip, I wanted to go over some fact sheets from CMS on the No Surprises Act intended to give you the basics. Now, their fact sheet number one is all about healthcare terms, medical bills, and forms, which can be difficult for the average person to understand. Now, they've outlined in this document some common healthcare terms and what they mean. So, why don't I begin with the allowed amount? Now, the allowed amount. This is the maximum payment the plan will pay for a covered health care service. Now, this may also be called eligible expense or the payment allowance or the negotiated rate. These are all synonymous terms to allowed amount. Now, for example, if you get services during an office visit from an in-network provider and your health plan's allowed amount for an office visit is $100, you'll pay $100 for that visit if you haven't met your deductible and the visit is subject to that deductible. But if you have met your deductible, you'll pay your coinsurance or your copayment amount instead, if that's applicable. Now, I'm gonna go over what coinsurance means, copayment means, and what your deductible is in a few minutes. Now, under certain circumstances, if your provider is out of network and charges more than the health plan's allowed amount, you may have to pay the difference. And don't worry, I'm going to be going over what that means in balance billing right now. So balance billing. That means when a provider bills you for the balance remaining on the bill that your plan does not cover. This amount is the difference between the actual billed amount and the allowed amount. For example, if your provider's charge is $200, but the allowed amount is $110, the provider may bill you for the remaining $90. This happens most often when you see an out-of-network provider or a non-preferred provider. But a network provider or a preferred provider may not balance bill you for covered services. Now let me move on to coinsurance. What is coinsurance? That's your share of the costs of a covered healthcare service calculated as a percent, for example, 20% of the allowed amount for the service is your coinsurance. You pay the coinsurance plus any deductibles you may owe. For example, if your health insurance plan's allowed amount for an office visit is $100 and your coinsurance is 20%, then, if you've paid your deductible, you pay that 20% of $100 or $20. The insurance company pays the rest. But if you haven't paid your deductible yet, you pay the full allowed amount, or $100, or the remaining balance until you've paid your yearly deductible, whichever is less. Now, let me move on to a complaint that should be self-sufficient, but let me go over a complaint. So healthcare providers, emergency facilities, and insurance plans must follow rules that protect consumers from surprise medical bills. If you believe your provider, your emergency facility, or your health plan did not follow the rules that protect consumers, you can submit a complaint to the No Surprises Help Desk. And let me give you that phone number. It's 1-800-985-3059. You may also need to send supporting documentation like your medical bills and your explanation of benefits to help support your complaint. Now let's move on to copayment. What's that? Copayment is a fixed amount, for example, $15, that you pay for a covered healthcare service, usually when you receive the service. Sometimes that's called the copay, right on site at the office visit. Now, this amount can vary by the type of covered healthcare service. For example, your health plan's allowable cost for a doctor's office visit is $100, but your copayment for a doctor visit is always going to be $20 for example. Now, if you've paid your deductible, you pay $20, usually at the time of the visit. 
But if you haven't paid your deductible, then you'll go ahead and pay the $100 or the full allowed amount for the visit or the remaining balance until you've paid your annual deductible, whichever is less. And it may be more, again, if the billed amount exceeds the allowed amount. Now let's move on to cost sharing. That means that's your share of the costs for services that a plan covers that you must pay out of your own pocket, which is sometimes called out-of-pocket costs. Now some examples of cost sharing or out-of-pocket costs are your copayments, your deductibles, and your coinsurance. Family cost sharing is the share of the cost for deductibles and out-of-pocket costs you and your spouse and or your children must pay out of your own pocket. Now, other costs, including your premiums and your penalties that you may have to pay, or the cost of care that a plan does not cover, these are usually not considered cost sharing. Now, your deductible. That's an amount that you could owe during a coverage period, usually one year, for the covered health care services before your plan actually begins to pay out. Now, an overall deductible applies to all or almost all covered items and services. A plan with an overall deductible may also have separate deductibles that apply to specific services or groups of services. A plan may also only have separate deductibles. For example, if your deductible is $1,000, your plan won't pay anything until you've met your $1,000 deductible for covered health care services that are subject to that $1,000 deductible. Then let's move on. Dispute. If you don't have an insurance or plan to use your insurance to pay for your care, you may be able to use the patient provider dispute resolution process if you disagree with your medical bill. Now, in this process, you can ask an independent third party to review your case. The third party is called a dispute resolution entity, and they will review the good faith estimate, your bill, and the information from your healthcare provider or facility to decide if you should pay the amount on your good faith estimate the bill charge, or a different amount. Now, during the patient provider dispute resolution process, you may still negotiate your bill with your provider or your facility. Now, let's move on. What is that explanation of benefits, the EOB? Now, this is a summary from your health plan of the total charges for the healthcare services that you received and how much you and your health plan will have to pay. This could be a paper copy that's mailed to you, or it could be emailed to you. This is not a bill. It is simply an explanation of benefits, your EOB. Now let's move on to the good faith estimate, the GFE. Now this is an estimate from a healthcare provider or facility for the expected costs of items or services. It, now, if you're uninsured or you're not using your insurance, the provider or the facility generally must give you a GFE before you get a health care service, if you ask for one, or if you schedule an appointment, at least three days before you get a health care service. In certain circumstances, a provider that isn't in your plan's network must also give you a GFE if it wishes to charge you more than your plan's in-network cost-sharing amount. Now, let's move on to what is an in-network provider. Now, these are providers or facilities that have a contract with your health plan to provide services for plan members at certain costs. Generally, if you get care with an in-network provider or facility, it will cost you less than if you get care with an out-of-network provider or out-of-network facility. Now, let's move on to insured. What does that mean? It's pretty self-explanatory, but this is someone with health insurance. Now, this can include people with insurance through their employer or health insurance that they bought through the health insurance marketplace directly from an insurance company or through an insurance agent or broker, Medicare, Medicaid, or TRICARE. Now let's move on to the No Surprises Act. Now this is new. It's a federal law that provides protections against getting surprise medical bills for out-of-network emergency services, some out-of-network non-emergency services related to a patient visit 
to an in-network facility and out-of-network air ambulance services. Now, for more information, you should be able to visit the public website at cms.gov forward slash no surprises forward slash consumers for much more information. Now, let's move on to the notice and consent form. Now, this is a form that you may get from out-of-network providers or facilities that tells you about your rights and your protections against surprise medical bills, and that gives you the option to waive those rights. Now, if you sign this form, you agree to give up rights that protect you from balanced billing, and you may be charged more for your medical care. This form is also known as a waiver. This type of notice and consent form is a separate form from other medical consent forms that a provider or facility may ask you to sign before they treat you. Now let's move on to what is an out-of-network provider. This is a provider who does not have a contract with your plan to provide services. If your plan covers out-of-network services, you'll usually pay more to see an out-of-network provider than a preferred or in-network provider. Now, your policy will explain what those costs may be. This may also be called a non-preferred provider or non-participating provider. Now, let's move on to out-of-pocket limits. The most you could pay during a coverage period, usually one year, for your share of the costs of covered services. After you meet this limit, the plan will usually pay 100% of the allowed amount. This limit helps you plan for the health care costs that you incur. This limit never includes your premium, balance bill charges, or health care that your plan does not cover. Some plans don't count all of your copayments, all of your deductibles, all of your coinsurance payments, your out-of-network payments, or other expenses towards this limit. Now let's move on to preferred provider. Now this is a provider who has a contract, once again, with your health insurer or the plan who has agreed to provide services to members of that plan. Now you'll be paying less if you see a provider in the network. This is also called the preferred provider or the participating provider. Now let's move on to what is a provider. Now this is an individual or a facility that provides health care services. Some examples of a provider include a doctor, a nurse, a chiropractor, a physician assistant, a hospital, a surgical center, a skilled nursing facility, and a rehabilitation center. Now the plan may require the provider to be licensed, certified, or accredited as required by state law. Now let's move on to self-pay. Now, self-pay patient is when someone who has health insurance chooses to pay their health care costs out of pocket without using their health insurance. And then let's move on to what is a surprise bill. Now, this is an unexpected balance bill for certain types of out-of-network costs that your insurance didn't cover. And then finally, what is uninsured? This means someone without health care coverage. So I thought that was a wonderful fact sheet developed by CMS for the average consumer. Now let's move on to this second fact sheet also developed by CMS for the No Surprises Act that involves what is a good faith estimate. This particular fact sheet dives into the fact that if you don't have health insurance or you plan to pay for health care bills by yourself, Generally, healthcare providers and facilities must give you an estimate of the expected charges when you schedule an appointment for a healthcare item or service, or if you simply ask for an estimate. This is what's known as a good faith estimate, the GFE. Now, a good faith estimate, remember, is not a bill. The good faith estimate shows the list of expected charges for items or services from your provider or the facility. Now, because the good faith estimate is based on information known at the time your provider or facility creates the estimate, it will not include any unknown or unexpected costs that may be added during your treatment. Generally, the good faith estimate must include expected charges for these two things, the primary item or the primary service, 
And then second, any other items or services you've reasonably expected to get as part of the primary item or primary service for that period of care. Now, the estimate might not include every item, once again, or every service that you get from another provider or another facility, even if some items or services may seem connected to the same service. For example, if you're getting a surgery, the good faith estimate could include the cost of the surgery, anesthesia, any lab services, or tests. In some cases, items or services related to the surgery that are scheduled separately, like certain pre-surgical appointments or physical therapy in the weeks after the surgery or post-op care, right, might not be included in the good faith estimate. You will get separate good faith estimates when you schedule those items or those services with that provider or that facility if you ask for it. Now you have rights. You have rights to a good faith estimate. Providers and facilities must give you the good faith estimate when these three things are done. Number one, after you schedule a health care item or service. If you schedule an item or service at least three business days before the date, you'll get the item or service. The provider must give you a good faith estimate no later than one business day after scheduling. If you schedule the item or service, or you ask for the cost information about it at least 10 business days before the date, you get the item or the service. The provider or facility must give you a good faith estimate no later than three business days after you schedule or ask for the estimate. Now, number two, that's going to include a list of each item or service with the provider or the facility, as well as specific details, like the healthcare service code, that CPT or HICPICS code. And then finally, third, in a way that's accessible to you, like in large print, in braille, in audio files, or other forms of communication that you can understand. Now, providers and facilities must also explain the good faith estimate to you over the phone, or in person if you ask, then follow up with a written communication, which means on paper or electronic, that estimate. Whichever way you prefer the form of communication, it's based on your needs and wants if you prefer it on paper or electronic. Now, make sure you keep the estimate in a safe place so you can compare it to any bills that you get later. Now, after you get a bill for the items or services, if the billed amount is $400 or more above the good faith estimate, you may be eligible to dispute the bill. And finally, I focus Season 6's Spark on vision and leadership. I want this six-season spark to be filled with the world's thought leaders, writers, artists, philosophers, everyone who inspires the need for vision and leadership in all we strive to do. So, in this week's inspiring quote, in Spark is from Theodore Hesper. The very essence of leadership is that you have to have vision. Absolutely true, right? I think this quote inspires us. It reminds us that to do great, to be great, revolves around vision. It's this mindset that we must hold on to and remember that we have the capability of vision. This quote inspires us to keep fueling our vision day after day, week after week, month after month. It allows us to soar. When we achieve the honor of that vision, we must continue by leading with a sense of purpose. I am happy Theodore Hesburgh's spark still shines brightly in all of us today. So that wraps up today's episode. And as always, I appreciate you all diving into today with me. If you want more information from me, please go ahead and follow me on LinkedIn. I'll leave links to everything in the show notes below. Now, all right, you guys, please go ahead and have an amazing week ahead and remember to carve out time for yourselves each and every day to keep your mental health strong. 
please continue staying safe and healthy as well overall because that pandemic we're still in it COVID-19 is still here the PHE has not been lifted just yet so thank you so much for listening in on today's episode and I hope every week with me brings you closer to helping your providers paint a masterpiece see you next Wednesday